1 Samuel chapter 29. I do appreciate the prayers. Um, Evie is still unwell. She's still sore throat and a runny nose and different things. She's still struggling, hanging on to this super cold, as I saw a headline on the BBC a couple of days ago. And my dad has now caught it. He's come back from America, um, not with coronavirus, just with a regular old cold. So um, he's unwell this morning. So there's several unwell. So do please pray. Pray for the carol service on Sunday, next Sunday. <clears throat> and it's good to see all, everyone here. Just by way of uh, mentioning, flying is the um, statistically the most safest way to travel. Just so that everyone knows that. You wouldn't think that. Our father in law stayed with us for, for several days. And what we watched, all we watched that seemed for days was um, air crash investigation. And so if you're watching things like that about a week, you, you start thinking every single plane falls out of the sky. <laughs> so, but that's not the case. So in 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 29, and we're going to be going from 29 all the way through to chapter 30 this morning. And we really are coming to an end of the book. We've probably got one or two messages after this week. <clears throat> In 1 Samuel, and then we come to an end. 31 chapters, three and a half, almost four years of um, not every Sunday, but you know, it feels like sometimes every Sunday we're coming to the end of the book. And at the end, when we get to the end, I want to preach a message on the overview. Because when you're going through chapter by chapter over a long period of time, you miss the, the what is God's plan in all of this. And sometimes we live day by day. And we lose sight of what is God's plan for our life. And we're looking at on Wednesday, we're going through the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> and we looked at on Wednesday that God has an inheritance in us. That is, he has, he's invested in us. He's, he's bought us with a price. That price was the shedding of his blood, the Son of God. And he has an inheritance in us. Not, not only do we have an inheritance in him, but there is an investment he has in us. And we are called not just to a purpose, but we're called to a glorious purpose. And we can easily, it's very easily to lose sight of that. Especially with everything that seems to be going on in the world today. It's easy to lose sight that there is a glorious purpose that we're called to. And then when I speak and witness to others, and, this, and, the, and the conversation turns to the topic of purpose, I can say... Oh, I just don't have a purpose in life because there are many young people that are struggling with that this morning, today. That there is a lack of purpose in their lives. They don't know why they're here. And I can say, oh, I'm just, I just don't have a purpose. I have a glorious purpose to my life. And that's to serve God in whatever way he deems me fit to serve him. In whatever ministry that may be, except to go to France. I don't particularly, Lord, you know, if he calls me to France, I'll be a Jonah, I'm afraid. But, uh, but other than that, I, I, he has a glorious purpose. And in chapter 29, we're now picking up in the, um, we're now picking up on David again. So in chapter 27, if you remember, it opens up with David has said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Bear in mind that just before that, he was in the camp of Saul. He was teaching his nephew, look, we're not going to kill Saul. We're not going to do this. This is the Lord's anointed. He went from this great mountaintop sort of experience of teaching the next generation, as it were, on how to live a godly life. And he was right in the enemy's camp and God was preserving him. And he was able to speak to Saul and say, why are you chasing after a flea? Why are you chasing me like a partridge? And we were talking, I was talking with Susie about pheasants the other day. It's interesting that he uses the term partridge because pheasants don't actually <laughs> like to fly. They like to run. And David can't fly away. He's running in the wilderness from one place to another place. And he says, why are you chasing me? I'm like a partridge. I'm a flea in comparison to you. And Saul is convicted and he says, I will not chase you anymore. But then the very next chapter he says, one day I'm going to perish at my hand of Saul. And here's the problem. He was on his own. And when a man is left to his own devices, man or lady are left to their own devices, it's easy to fall into a heart of discouragement. Consequently, you begin backsliding. And that's what David was. He was no longer running away. 
he got on his own and he was discouraged. And then in chapter 28, it goes from um, David and moves to Saul. And we looked at the witch at Endor and how we saw how that was the deception of hell. And that it wasn't Samuel. It was one of the, one of the demons, one of Satan's um, plans of deception. We saw how easily it is that people are deceived by Satan. And now we're back to chapter 29. And David is still in the land of the Philistines. He's still not walking with God. He is not in God's land. He's left that land of rest. And in chapter 29, we're going to begin reading in verse 6, in chapter 29, and then we'll open with a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing. It says, Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out, and thy coming in with me in the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favour thee not. That was the princes of the Philistine army. So the Philistine army have gathered together, and the army is passing through them. They're getting themselves organised. They're probably in columns, I'd imagine. The, Philistine, the Philistines were originally from Crete in that area, and so they would have been potentially um, maybe Greek in their background, Greekish in their background. And they would have marched in columns. So, so the army is marching before the princes, and the princes are saying, Isn't this David? Isn't his master Saul? Isn't this one that they sung songs about saying they've sung, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands? They remembered. And they're like, No, he can't go to battle with us in case he reconciles with his master and turns against us. And David says, Let me follow with you, and you will see what me and my men can do. And David said that with confidence. He had been battling. Since he was in the Philistine army, he had fought against the Amicalites and the Jeshurites and the several other tribes that were not meant to be in the land that God said to drive out. And so these men were battle hardened. They were ready to go to battle. But the princes were saying no. And so in verse 8, in verse 7, we'll pick up reading again. It says, Wherefore now return and go in peace that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done, and what hast thou done in thy see, what hast thou found in thy servant, so as long as I have been with thee unto this day, that I may not go fight against the enemies of my Lord the King? And you'll find that phrase that comes out of David's mouth quite often. He says, What have I done? He says it to Jonathan, he says it to Saul, and he says it to King Achish. What have I done? That you would just not leave me, me, leave me alone. Why can you not just leave me be? Why will you not let me fight with you? Why are you, why are you trying to kill me? Why will you not let me serve you? What have I done? And in verse 11 it says, So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. And so David leaves the Philistine army and he heads back to the one place that he's been able to actually call home for several years, Ziklag. <coughs> he made a home there. That was a land given to him by Achish. That was the encampment, the land, the home that he was able to go out and raid these other lands. Yes, he lied to Achish about what he was doing, but for the first time in several years, he had a home, a harbour. You know, if I can go home, but if unless my family's there, for me, this is just me personally, it's not home. If I call up and say, hey, I'm on my way home, generally it's a say, look, I'm on my way home. I'm going to get dinner ready. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to word it that way, but she knows what I'm talking about. She knows what I'm saying. Look, I'm on my way home. I'm going to be half an hour. And, um, but unless, if they're not there, if my wife and kids aren't there, I don't go home. I try not to go home. I don't like walking in in silence. I walk in and it feels empty. Yes, the settee's there, the TV's there, the, the heating's there, there's food there. But it's not my home. Because my family's not there. And David had a home to go back to. And we'll see that the family's not there. But David was still in the backslidden state. 
And we're now going to see in the following chapter what it took for him to get right with the Lord and the power that he had and the, and the picture of Christ that we see in David once he was right with God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I ask you to bless us now. Forgive me for my sins, Father, you know what they are. And Lord, there's nothing I can do on my own. But Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower us all, Father, to see the truth in thy word. Lord, help me to communicate thy word um, clearly. And Lord, help me to say everything I say will be according to thy word and thy will this morning. And encourage us, convict us, bless us. Father, you can do all those things and more to us individually because of our personal relationship with thee. I ask these things in your son's name. Amen. <coughs> and so David goes and leaves, and this was really an intervention on God's heart, on God's behalf. Had David fought with Israel, we, we cannot completely imagine the ramifications of that if he had gone and fought against his brethren. He was anointed to be the next king of Israel and God intervenes on his behalf. And just because we're in a backslidden state, well, another brother in Christ is in a backslidden state. And just because a child of God is not walking with God, that does not mean he is forsaken by God. God said in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, at the last half of that verse, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We are once saved, always saved. Christ died once, and so salvation is only once. And once you are saved, the Holy Spirit sets to your seal that God is true. And so just because Sam David was not walking with the Lord, does not mean he was forsaken of God. And you can see that as he in intervenes on David's behalf. He stops him from fighting against the nation of Israel. But God had to bring him to that point of where he would turn back to him. Right now, over David's life, there were grey clouds of sin and backsliding. And so in verse 1 of chapter 30, we see David's distress. It says, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag had, and, and south, and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. And they're taking women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, carried them away, and went on their way. And David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. I want us to think about this for one minute. At this point in time, we are now reading this and looking back. We know the result. But when David and the 600 men had come to their town, had come to their home, they just see it burned with fire and everyone's gone. As far as they're concerned, their children have been killed, their wives have been raped, and everything is over. Their city is burned, their goods are gone. They have absolutely no clue that they're all still alive. And I want us to think about this phrase that it says here in verse 4. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Can you imagine the distress of your soul? You are crying, you are weeping, and you are weeping until there is no more weeping to be done. Your head is on fire because you have a headache. Your heart is aching because of the, the emotional pain brings about physical pain. Your wife, your family, and everything you own is gone. The men that you're in charge with, they are holding you responsible. There was no garrison left. There was no rear guard left. Everybody's families were gone. David's two wives, we read in verse 5, are gone. And in verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. And you can't, you can't in that moment actually get upset with them because in that moment of, 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 of following their leader, their leader has now caused their wives and their families and their livestock and all their earthly goods to be gone, they're finished. 
And can I tell you that there are some people that will never get over the loss of their loved ones when they are taken from them in such a dramatic way. Whether you've lost a child or someone's lost a child through a car crash or through an accident, my wife greatly gets concerned when my children have to go on long car journeys because she knows that it only takes one person to not be paying attention to cause an accident and loss of life gone all in one car. And that is understandable. I can completely understand that. That's why we pray before we leave. But the Lord has preserved thy coming in and thy going out, the Bible says. And the men wanted to stone David. And David, in his anger and in his right mind, in, in his anger mind, in his bitterness of soul, he could have turned around and said to those men, no, you are not going to hang me. In anger, he could have run them through with a sword. He could have had them hung. But he doesn't do any of that. This is what was necessary to bring David back to the point of worshipping the Lord. This is what was necessary to bring David back to that point of a fellowship with God. The whole thing changes when it says in verse 6 at the end, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. That is the diamond in this passage. It is the hinge upon which the backslidden soul hinges back to the Lord. The door opens and Jesus Christ is able to enter. He says, I am at the door and I knock. He has encouraged himself in the Lord. And he ignores the, the cause for the men to have him stoned. He ignores the cause for the men to, in their anger and their bitterness. And he becomes singly focused and says, I pray thee, he says to him, him, Ahimelech's son, the high priest, he says, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. Bring me hither the ephod. And you know what, that is what leadership is. Leadership is able to take something like this, encourage yourself in the Lord, ignore the naysayers, and say, let's pray. And do we not need leadership like that today? Let's pray. Yes, we are in a country at the moment that's going through plan B, whatever that may mean, and all the different things that that brings. But the Christian can say, let's pray. You may remember back in World War II, there was a day of prayer. You remember you used to may hear the kings would say, let's pray, God be with us. I was listening to a documentary, a podcast about King George V, and I heard, I think it was King George V, and I heard the BBC narrator talking about how he's now married, and it's a good family, a well good family, the BBC narrator said, with two children, which upon all good nations are built. What's changed? You will not hear BBC narrators talk about families that way, upon all good nations are built, the family. God is no longer in the eyes of our leaders today. And Jesus Christ would say about the Pharisees, let the blind lead the blind and both shall fall into the ditch. But we as Christians, we're different. We can say, let's pray. Let's pray. And in David's distress, he recognises, and he would in the future write, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, they than much fine gold, sweet water than honey, out of the honeycomb. David has come to that point in his life again where he has come to the mountaintop and he can see the sun. The great clouds are broken and the, sun, and the sunshine is shining through because he has encouraged himself in the Lord and he has asked Ahimelech for the ephod. What is the ephod? If we turn to, to the book of Exodus. To the book of Exodus in chapter 28. We recognise that David... As you go through the book of Samuel, David often asked for the ephod and the high priest. You recognize, you might remember that Samuel, he had no high priest. God was not answering his prayer. And in Exodus chapter 28, we begin reading with verse 6. 
and it says, and they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, of scarlet, of fine twined linen, with cunning work. It shall have two shoulder pieces thereof, joined at the two edges thereof, and so shall it be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen. And thou shalt take the two onyx stones and grave them, engrave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet. Shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel, thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. Thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod, the stones of memorial, unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for memorial. So basically what the ephod was, was a garment that was worn over the main garment that the high priest would put on. And this garment was joined together, it, had, it, was two shoulder, it was two stones on the shoulder pieces, joined together by a chain. And they would lay it and they would put it over his head. And those shoulder pieces would rest on the shoulders of the high priest. And he had six names of tribes on one shoulder, and six names of the other twelve tribes of Israel on the other shoulder. And then he would take that ephod, and then he would go into the temple, or he would go before the presence of the Lord, whether there was a tabernacle, temple, or synagogue, and he would bring the petitions of God's people to Israel, to God, sorry. He was the representative that would carry the burdens of the nation. It is upon the shoulders that all burdens are carried. When I, used, when I do my training, when I used to, I haven't been to the gym for a long, long time, I might have noticed it. But when I used to do my training, I wear a weighted vest, and I'd go for a run, or go for a walk, or push-ups, or pull-ups, and that weighted vest would bear down on my shoulders. Because God has designed the human body where the weight can be taken on shoulders. When you wear a bergen, you sometimes have to wear a high so it bears down on the shoulders. And this is a picture of the high priest interceding for the children of Israel, taking the burdens of the nation to God. And David would ask for the ephod. We have David's direction. He would ask for the ephod to be given to him because he was going to bring the burdens of his people through the high priest to the Lord to seek direction of what to do. And beloved, we read, we won't take the time because we're running out of time, I know we're cold. But beloved, as we read in Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, that Jesus Christ is our great and high priest. Because he was pointed and not tempted and not pointed as we are, yet without sin, he is able to succor them that need to be succored. He is our high priest that we can take our burdens to. In times of distress and in times of struggle and in times of torment, we can go to Jesus Christ and know that he's been there. He is the captain of our salvation which is made perfect through sufferings. He has suffered all things. He knows what it means to be lonely. He knows what it means to be hungry. We saw in our, when we looked at what it means to be a disciple. He says that no man that had put his hand, put his, put his hand to the plough can look back. He knows that being a disciple is going to take work. He knows that because he is Jesus Christ whom we're following. We're following in his footsteps. But we see David's direction as he takes that ephod and comes before the Lord. If you turn me to Luke chapter 15. Luke in chapter 15. In verse 3. It says, And he spake this power once then, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. See, this sheep, this, this, we are sheep. This isn't talking about the lost. The lost are referred to as goats. We're sheep. 
And when that one sheep goes, that's a Christian that's left the fold, that's left the flock, flock, that's left the shepherd, and the shepherd has gone after that one sheep. And when he finds that one sheep, he lays it on his shoulders. He carries that one sheep. And he brings that one sheep back. I can't help but think I any of us here this morning, that one sheep that has left the flock. That I found ourselves in a time of discouragement and confusion. Are we being distracted by what's going on in the world and losing sight of what God's will is for our life? If so, all we have to do is pray. Lord, come and lay me on your shoulders. Bring me back to thee. And he will. You just heard the testimony of Jean saying how he hears and answers our prayers. And he does. Lord, he is our great high priest, and he wants to carry us back to him when we are discouraged. Jesus Christ would say that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I do not know what your burdens are today, but God does. Don't let those burdens crush you. Don't let the world's burdens crush you, but give them to him and take on his yoke, because it is easy and his burden is light. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And there is a perfect peace that passeth all understanding as a child of God. But we have to stay with that ephod. And we don't need an ephod. We can now come before the throne of grace because he is our high priest. And think about the seat that Christ sits on. In the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, and in the temple, it was the mercy seat. Under the law, you can't ask God for mercy because you cannot keep the law. But now in the New Testament, we're saved. Not by love, but we're saved by grace. God's unmerited favour to us. And so as we're saved by grace, we're kept by grace, and consequently we can enter into that throne of grace. And right now we need all the grace we can get. And God is willing to give that as an everlasting fountain of grace. His everlasting unmerited favour upon us to walk with him to sustain us through a life that is full of burdens and cares in this world. And though it's not easy, but the burden of Christ is light. And may we do this so that we can live a life before the final scene, which is the great white throne of judgment that the world, the lost, will face. <clears throat> right now there's a throne of grace, but that throne of grace will not always be the throne of grace as we have it now. There will be a throne. There will be a judgment seat of Christ upon the Christians and a great white throne to the lost. Mercy, grace, and then judgment. And we need to make sure that we're walking with him, sustained by his grace, recognising him as our saviour and our shepherd. And so David turns, he gets right with the Lord, he comes back to the Lord, he asks for God's direction. We see David's distress, his final distress. We see David's direction, and now we see David as captain in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 13. It says, So David went, and he and 600 men that were with him came to the book of Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. And David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which was so faint they could not go over to the brook of Esau. Here they get to the brook and there's 200 men, they're just tired. They're faint. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. There are times in our life when the strongest Christian will grow faint. There are times in our life when we wouldn't think we'd ever win. We wouldn't grow faint, but we do. You know, David doesn't let this deter him. David may be thinking, I've got to go fight a battle with 200 less men. And he just says, no man, you stay here. It's not for the will of the fight. It's not like they don't have the will to fight. I mean, these are 600 men that are battle-hardened. If you would, I'm sure if you, would have, if you would have pulled up their sleeves and they would have shown you their forearms, it would have been forearms that were, that were used to holding swords and spears and shields for hours upon, hours upon end. I'm sure that they have scars on their bodies 
or marks on spears and arrows and cuts. These were battle-hardened men, but they were faint. They were tired. And David is not discouraged by this. He acts as their captain. Did you stay here? We will continue and we will fight. Beloved, sometimes we just get so faint that we all we can do is rest upon the Lord. God wants to bring us to that point where we just rest on the Lord. Oh, we have the will to fight. And we have the mind and the spirit to do so, but sometimes we just we just can't go on. There's no shame in that. And that's why Jesus Christ said that he is the captain of our salvation. He will go forward and fight the battle for us. Through him we are more than conquerors. In Jesus Christ, if God, the Romans chapter 8 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And David said, I will go on and fight. Moving quickly forward, but in 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, verse 9 through 10, we won't take the time to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, it says, My grace is sufficient for thee. In your weakness, I am made strong. So when we get to that time in our lives, when we feel weak and we can't carry on, that's okay. God knows that. It's at those times that God says, you know what? This is where you're going to see me. This is where you're going to draw to me. This is where you're going to see the comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit. So just sit down, relax, and let me do the work. Put the burden on me. And then we see in the last point here this morning, that David rightly divides. And I won't take the time to read the whole passage, but begin with verse 16. Ends in verse 23. David goes out, and in verse 16 it says, And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And so he's come upon the enemy camp. We'll skip the Egyptians for now. Maybe the Lord will bring that into our path in the future but the Lord brings he comes upon the enemy camp and they're dancing, they're carrying on they're partying 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us that when there's peace and safety then sudden destruction you see the world when they take the spoil of what is given to them they have a tendency to spend it on the river of the flesh they spend it on the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. They were having a great time, they were having a great party. They thought, great, this is it. Well, we're going to give sacrifices to our God, our idol gods. We're going to give sacrifices to all these people. We're just going to have ourselves a good time because we've got all this spoil. And little did they know that sudden destruction was coming upon them. And that sudden destruction was coming upon them because David said, that God said to David, you will find them and you will overtake them. And so then, David chases them. And not only does he get his wives back, not only does he get his castle back, not only do the men get their children back and their wives back, not only do they get their castle back and their herds back, but he also gets all the spoil from the other places that they had raided. He also gets all of the other people's spoil. And so he's now got more than what he had when he first started. Look, that's God's unmerited favour. Now, I'm not preaching the prosperity gospel. I'm not saying you get right with God and you're going to come next Sunday morning in a Ferrari. If you do, let me know. Okay, I will be round. But obviously that's not what's going on here. Our blessings are more than likely going to be heavenly blessings, spiritual blessings, blessings and rewards that will come later when we face the judgment, when we come before Jesus Christ in the judgment scene. But he comes and he takes, and 400 escape, 400 Amalekites escape on camels. And when he comes back, we hear see David rightly divides. In verse 22, it says, Then answered all the wicked and the men of Belial, or those that went with him, with David, 
and said, Because they went not because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. So the men of Bilal that were with David, just because they were men following David doesn't mean that they were all good, upright, spiritual men. There's always going to be tears within the wheat. You can't help that. That's the way of the world. And we're not to pluck out the tares in case we fill up the wheat. But just wait for that harvest to come. And so these men, again, David, he doesn't come to the whims of the people. David allows God to be his judge and he follows the moral law of God. The morality within his company was dictated by God's law, not man's word. And that's what we need to pray for today. That the morality that comes from our government, as hopeless as it may seem, just pray that the morality will come from God and not man's word. I remember when they... I will never forget the phrase that I heard when they were voting in same-sex marriage, which has now brought in the downward spiral of transgenderism and everything that else comes, and they don't know what they are anymore. And I dare say that in the future, we're not going to just see same-sex marriage, we're going to see more and more polygamy in marriage, where you'll have four people in a marriage, three people in a marriage, because all boundaries have been dropped. Right. It's ungodly, it's not right, but when that same-sex marriage vote came in, I heard two politicians on the Conservatives say that each politician has to vote according to their own conscience. <coughs> and one said they have to vote according to that which is right in their own eyes. I heard one politician say that, a lady politician. Welcome to the time of judges. That's it. But that does not mean we pray. Just because we may be in a time of judges doesn't mean that God will not raise up a judge. God hears and answers the prayers of his saints. And David was a man that followed the law of God, not the whims of men. And so he would lead and he said, Ye shall not do this so, my brethren. He says, these are my brethren. Just because they stay behind this time doesn't mean they don't deserve the spoils of war. And it isn't our spoils. Look what he says. He says, with that which the Lord hath given us. This is the Lord's. And we are all one body. We are all one army. We are all one people. And beloved, I cannot help but see that in the church today. We are all one people, saved by one Saviour, by one God, in one faith. And it is not the whole body for the nourishment for the whole body. Who hath preserved us? God is going to preserve his body. He's going to keep his body. It's his body. No one else's. It's not the government's. It's not the world's. It's not Satan's. Jesus Christ said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's going to preserve us. And I've delivered the company that came against us into our hand. I can guarantee you, when you start witnessing to people, when we share the gospel, you are going to deliver the con their conscience before God. When you share the word of God. They may put up that bravado. You say, I don't need God in my life. They may put up that bravado, what you're saying is not science. <clears throat> they may put up all of this show, but I can tell you now, if you just share the word of God, their conscience is going to be brought before God. David would share the spoil with the rest of the people. And in verse 26, we read that he then gave the spoil to Judah and to others that looked after him and helped him. Beloved, what God blesses us with is not for us to spend. I would say this, 
on our own flesh and our own lives. Not to say that we can't have nice things, we can't have a few Christmas things here and there. I'm not saying that. But beloved, we are to help each other. We are to look upon every other man's need and not on our own things in Philippians chapter 2. And if we see our brethren in trouble, help. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If we want to receive mercy, let's show mercy. And in closing, you turn me to Ephesians, and this is something I've mentioned a few times. And we've been looking at this on a Wednesday night, but I find it such a blessing to know very briefly, if we look at Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God has always chosen to have the church. He predestinated the church to be conformed to the image of Christ. And predestination is not an ugly word. We've gone through this several times. It should not be an ugly word. But it should be a word of encouragement that if you are born again this morning, God is not going to give up on you. He has predestined you to be conformed to the image of Christ. The Bible speaks nothing of the predestination of the lost. So just throw it out and cast it out of your mind because it's not biblical, it's untrue, and it's ungodly. Predestination only applies to the born-again Christian. And God has predestinated us. This is God. God the Father has done this. But it's Jesus Christ that has paid for the church. In verse 7, it says, in verse 6, it says, To the praise and glory of His grace, where He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. God planned the church, Christ paid for the church. This is not my outline, this is John Vernon McGee's. I need to pop that there on the text. But I find it such a blessing, this has been on my mind, and it just puts everything else to bed in the rest of the world. And then we have the Holy Spirit that protects the church. In verse 13, in whom also you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after he believed, he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. God planned the church, Christ paid for the church, and the Holy Spirit protects the church. And we have all the blessings in between from beginning to end. We have a glorious purpose. We have an inheritance in Christ, and God has an inheritance in us. We are one body, and so we may go through times of distress. But turn to God and encourage yourself in the Lord to seek God's direction. And when the blessings come your way, give a word of testimony. Share the spoil. Let people know that God has worked on your behalf. And let that be an encouragement to others. And be an example. Sometimes we all get weak. We all get tired. And sometimes we need others to help us to be that example as David was. Let's pray.